Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marina Lajetic and I'm a PhD student at the Fletcher School and a project manager of the Initiative on Forced Displacement at Boston University. Uh, today I'm talking to Teodora Jovanovic, who is a PhD student and a research assistant at the Institute of Ethnography at the Serbian Academy of Science and the Arts. And the two of us uh, were also researchers for refugees in towns. We wrote a report on Belgrade that was published in April 2018. So we conducted most of our research for that report in 2017. And quite a few things changed in Belgrade and in Serbia since that time. So I'm going to actually start this conversation by inviting Teodora to give us a little bit of an update and uh, a brief overview of what's going on with the migrants in Serbia and how things have changed since our report was published. Thank you, Marina. Well, uh, Balkans are still a stop for many refugees and migrants who are trying to uh, reach the countries of the European Union. Um, lately, uh, Bosnia has become a hotspot with uh, over 7,000 migrants and refugees living in very bad conditions there. And both uh, Serbia uh, and Bosnia border with Croatia, which is uh, in the EU, uh, while uh, Serbia and Bosnia are not. So here you can see uh, how these movements actually look like on a map. Uh, well, um, border closures and securitarian policies and restrictive measures did not stop people from moving. Rather, they have slowed down uh, the movement in the region. Um, so uh, refugees are transiting and being stuck at the same time. Uh, and according to the latest UNHCR report, uh, currently there are around uh, 5,300 uh, asylum seekers and migrants uh, present in Serbia. Around uh, 4,000 of them are accommodated in government-provided centers. Uh, the rest of them are staying outside of the centers in informal settlements, which are usually uh, near the borders or in the Belgrade city centers, where uh, they are trying to find the smugglers and cross ir irregularly. This is because the possibility of crossing the borders regularly is uh, practically uh, non-existent. Um, and available uh, services are limited to these uh, government-provided centers where uh, registered asylum seekers are accommodated. Um, these services uh, include shelter, food, water, electricity, and sanitation services, basically the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Teodora, at this point that are some of the biggest challenges for the migrants who are in Serbia? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that the main challenge for them is reaching uh, their destination countries in the EU and crossing uh, the border with Croatia or sometimes Hungary, but this is basically impossible because the border between Serbia and Hungary is the most controlled one in the region. And for those who want to stay in Serbia, the integration would be uh, the main challenge. Um, and police violence on the border with Croatia has increased uh, drastically and people are constantly being pushed back. And uh, certain uh, activist groups are documenting this violence at the borders and some efforts have been made to alert the uh, EU uh, about the violence, but it is still happening and it is brutal. And contrary to that, uh, we hear a lot of narratives and story how migrants are somehow the aggressors. So uh, maybe Marina, you can tell us something about that. I mean, what are the uh, host population attitudes toward migrants and what are the relationships between the locals and the migrants? Yes, sure. So some of the stuff as you remember, it was in our report, some of it, but quite a lot has changed since really, because at the time we were doing our report, um, you know, people were still very welcoming in a way that they kind of knew that migrants were not intending to stay in Serbia for a long time. They were majorly just mostly just transitioning to the country and leaving within about 72 hours. Um, so people were welcoming, they were helping a lot. A lot of people were actually also contributing their own resources um, and aid, providing aid directly to the migrants. Um, and some were obviously also volunteering and contributing to the NGOs that were providing services. Um, however, 
that has changed quite a bit since we did our report and since a lot of people started staying in or getting stuck as you as you have just shared with us um, in in Serbia and in Bosnia so because of that attitudes are slowly shifting um, and uh, to the negative unfortunately um, there was also no real like political activity around migrants and there was no not much political rhetoric around uh, their presence in the city and in the country overall, but that has also changed. And I think is contributing to these negative attitudes of local populations too. So we see a lot more, um, you know, far right activists and anti-immigration activists organizing against president, against migrants, uh, protesting in front of government provided centers and um, sort of mobilizing support for this anti-immigration movement. Um, and it is adding to a fear factor in local populations. There have been some incidents, unfortunately, where migrants, for example, broke into a store or a shop or um, things like that. So, you know, those incidents combined with this negative rhetoric have really added to shift in attitudes that we're seeing lately. Yeah. Um, you're totally right. And uh, do you think that uh, the situation changed with the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah, well, actually, I would love to hear more from you. But from what I see, um, you know, from where I stand, uh, it has changed quite a bit because the restrictive measures uh, due to the coronavirus have been disproportionately applied to the migrants. So Serbia had really intense and strict curfews at the beginning of the pandemic so that, you know, people were not allowed to move freely um, and they were kind of the curfew lasted for a few days at a time too. But for migrants, it was really a 24 seven curfew. So people were not allowed to leave uh, migration centers and asylum centers. And it has changed because those restrictive measures unfortunately stayed even after they were lifted for the citizens. And on top of that too, actually um, the government has mobilized army to guard these government uh, these uh, government provided asylum centers too so we're seeing increased uh, securitization and policing of migrants uh, which is quite worrisome at this point point. Um, and i was wondering actually you were saying that you were doing also some field research so can you tell us just a little bit more about what you saw when you went to visit these uh, government centers right now uh yeah well uh, when i was in Sheed, um I saw uh, the military police uh, present there and I saw uh, like they uh, walk around with guns and stuff. So mm -hmm. it, um, and they, um, they uh, did this because they want the, the citizens of Sheed, uh, they feel protected now when they have military and actually, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> the greatest thing. Yeah, yes. Um and uh, can you tell us, Marina, uh, I mean, what do you think would be the like future of migration policy based on your most recent research that you told me about? Uh, do you think that uh, integration would be possible? Yeah, so my most recent research is really kind of looking into this extremism and migration nexus. So looking through that, what I can observe is that there is very much lack of interest in any sort of integration of migrants. It is also true that migrants do not really want to stay in the Balkans um, or in Serbia or Bosnia, but the truth is also that they don't have an option either. Um, integration systems don't exist and the EU has also kind of been um, dropping the ball on the Balkans when it comes to this. So we saw some resources, um, you know, given that have helped with serv uh, service provision and things like that. But when it comes to policy, we don't see any changes. And EU was really a driving force for policy making in the region, um, but we haven't seen it pushing for uh, any kind of change and for um, you know policies that would allow migrants to integrate or for kids to go to school or anything like that. So I'm not seeing anything and I wonder if you have seen something different um, or if you see any sort of efforts and attempts to integrate migrants or if uh, we're pretty much just stuck at this containment policy. Yeah, well, as you said, there is no real integration plan. Uh, they have been efforts to include children from uh, government provided centers in local school, but this is not enough when we talk about integration and these people are really excluded from the labor market. 
Uh, and I think that generally in the EU and uh, in, at the margins of the EU, it is being invested in border control and stopping the movement of uh, people instead of integration. So honestly, uh, I believe that this trend is very dangerous and it can cause a lot of harm. And I think that we still have to um, work on explaining the people what is uh, really going on here and uh, go beyond this far right narratives uh, that are actually trying to, um, they, are, they are just a tool for these restrictive measures mm -hmm. and for controls. Thank you so much, Theodore. I think we're going to end it here and I look forward to a live discussion after this.